So what, what portion are we on? Are we on the second portion of Deuteronomy? Maybe uh, chapter 3, verse 23? Yep. Would I be correct? You are correct. Well, let's see what we have here. Verse 23 begins the chapter 3 of Deuteronomy. Verse 23. You can be confused pretty easy on those numbers. I do. Who would like to start reading with verse 23? I meant, Lord, I said, And the Jew at the top of this were not seeing a likeness, only a sound. He told, I read this over. Hold on a second, Dan. Gather your thought. I want to. I want to ask some questions here. How many of you have have felt you heard? How many of you have felt you heard Elohim, Yahweh, speak to you, but you just can't quite figure out what He wants? Have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever heard? Have you ever heard Yeshua or the Ruach pushing you? And you just can't quite grasp what he really wants. I think that, that pretty much describes our, our, our calling, our walk. I mean, mm -hmm. we don't automatically come into the, the faith knowing exactly where we're going. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, every aspect of it is that way. I mean, and, and the more you learn, the more you discover, the more you've got to learn. The more of a basis you've got to learn more. Yeah, but I thought you were talking about actually hearing a voice. I, I've never actually, I can't say I, I've never really... I can't say, I mean, I, I can say it. I've never heard his voice. The audible voice. I've never heard the audible voice. Right. Right. But you've heard him. You've heard him in things that happen. Right. Like how we ended up adopting Irina. That was obviously him, his hand. Oh, I could say his footprints. I could see his okay. footprints in my, in my life. Say so, yeah. it. Everybody realize we, we, we have a new brother with us today, so we have to give him some margin here. Sure. We're using a lot of names that you probably don't recognize, okay? So just bear with us. It'll come to you as it comes, okay? Just don't fight it. Yeah, don't fight it. Do you, do you, do you have a book? Do you have a Bible? Okay, very good. Yeah. Jim. I think there's a reason we don't actually hear audibly his voice today mm -hmm. and that's because in the, in the beginning in the garden he visited Adam and Eve we're in like the third time because then when Moses he walked with mm -hmm. which there's a difference that means he was always with them but he was just with them and now since Yeshua Jesus he is in us. So we don't need the audible voice when He is in our heart and our heart should tell us and talk, speak to us through the Ruach, the Spirit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's look at it this way. I can name at least three people that I know that I feel certain heard His audible voice. Adam? Yeah, but the three individuals, I guess I should have said it that way, okay? King Solomon's, uh, when he was a son, uh, heard his voice. Well, here's my three, okay? I say Adam, Moshe, okay, and Shaul. Above. Shaul. Huh? Above. Yeah, above. I'm talking, I'm a man. Oh. <laughs> I'm a man. I have no doubt... That he all hurt her. Yeah, she did. Okay. And then she didn't. <laughs> and then Adam didn't. Okay. And the whole thing got off track. And on, on the mountain, when they were gathered at the foot of the mountain, yeah, all of Israel heard his voice. And wasn't there a, a woman that said, if you can have a son or have, have a child, and his son so dedicated to uh, the Yahweh? And she did, and I believe his name was Samuel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Samuel was hearing voices, and the fella that he was mm -hmm. being cared with uh, 
uh, finally told him because uh, he would tell Samuel to, to be quiet, and then uh, he said, "Well, now you need to listen to that voice that you hear because it's uh, it's your voice." There is water in this cooler, and it is cold water. If anybody wants one, feel free. You have to get one. Brother, when I first started to attend Shalom Judaica down in Englewood, mm -hmm. was studying a drive back and forth sometimes a couple times a week. Mm -hmm. I stopped one afternoon to, to get a cold drink there at uh, West Carrollton. <coughs> and, uh, oh, I had things on my mind. You know, to deal with a lot there and family problems and everything. Mm -hmm. And I got back out in the car and, and I, I started to leave. And I prayed a weepy little weak prayer. I said, oh Yahweh, help me to be faithful. I'm not going to name the voice, but I heard a voice. It said, Yar, shut up and drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing about Shalom Judaica. <laughs> okay? It's an awfully funny thing. I stopped there one time. I stopped there the second time. I bought a book. When I got out in the parking lot, I sat down in my Jeep and I opened that book up. My intention was just to kind of read the foreword before I started the engine. Now it was hot, much like the weather we're having right now. I sat there and the top was off and I just sat there and I opened that book up and, you know, I was just going to read the foreword, right? By the time I realized anything, I had read half the book. I'm glad it wasn't like a thousand pages, okay? But I had read half that book because I allowed the book to speak to me. I allowed it to speak to I, me. I've had instances like that where, you know, you just open the book, I mean, it just falls where it falls, and then I start reading, I, I was like, well, this is what I needed. Is he speaking to me? I guess if you say he's speaking to me. I drove home. I went in the house. And I sat down in my chair. And I finished the book. I finished the book. Yeah, I, 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 I said that he does speak, speak to you when you're reading scripture. Mm -hmm. That's why we have we have a real uh, true conversation going on, don't we? This book wasn't scripture. The book I had was a, was a book written by Rabbi Barney Kasdan, San Diego, California. He, uh, the book was called God's Appointed Times. And it was simply a book about Leviticus 23, to say, to say it properly. And once, once the light bulb came on about Leviticus 23, there was no stopping. Best five dollars and fifty cents I ever spent. By the way, Shoshana sells that book now for about eleven fifty. Last time I bought a copy of it, I reminded her of that. <laughs> she also told me it had been over ten years since I bought that first copy. <laughs> but at any rate, important as they as this very day. Uh, I just want to stop it for, for a moment, Carol. Sure. How many of you come from Egypt? Of all, of all from Egypt in Anybody not come from Egypt? Never been there. Never been there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I resided in Egypt for a lot of years. Well, you might still be there. You understand what we're saying? You know where <laughs> Egypt is? I don't why I stopped by here. No. Not the country of Egypt. Egypt is where you're at before you come to Yeshua. You're living in Egypt. Being it's being out in the world. It's being out with all the nonsense going on, all the craziness, <laughs> all the bad stuff, you know. We all lived in Egypt. Everybody in this room came out of Egypt. Nobody nobody came from the above. Okay. Anybody not think they came from Egypt? None of us want to go back to Egypt. No, we crossed the Jordan. Yeah, we done crossed over. We're Hebrews now. Okay, we crossed over. Go ahead, Danny. Yahweh became angry. Go well with you, and you will live long in the land you are about to possess.
chapter 6. Chapter 6 is a very important chapter. Chapter 6 will stop once. But is that our Shema? Yes, it is. Chapter 6 contains the Shema. And it doesn't make any difference what faith you are. It doesn't make any difference if you're Protestant, Catholic, if you're Baptist, if you're Pentecostal, or if you're Hebrew. The Shema is the basis of faith in Yahweh our Elohim. Amen. That is the foundation. The very foundation of the faith is the Shema. And we read that today. No matter, yes. No matter, no matter what what denomination you want to sit in, if they tell you that Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is not part of that foundation, you better run out the door. Okay? Because they're not based right. Who wants to read chapter 6? Read 6? Read 6 up to 4. Stop at 4 for me, Melissa, please. Or stop before 4. Stop right at, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> This is the instruction. This is the instruction. The laws and the rules that Yahweh your Elohim has commanded to impart to you to be observed in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you, your children, and your children's children may revere Yahweh your Elohim and follow as long as you live all his all his laws and commandments that I enjoin upon you to the end that you may long endure. Obey, O Israel, willingly and faithfully, that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh the yeah. Elohim yeah, of your fathers spoke to you. I know why Melissa wanted to read that now. It says, a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> Are we to read this all together, chapter 4? I mean, well, just one second. I want to. I, I lost my Bible. thought here. Oh, that's right, we do. Every now and then I lose my thought. Um, this is the commandment. Go back to the first verse. This is the commandment and the decree and the ordinances that Yahweh, your Elohim, commanded to teach you to perform in the land to which you are crossing, to possess it. You see, when, 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 you're, when you're crossing out of the wilderness, and you're accepting Him, and you're accepting Yeshua, and you're beginning to follow the Ruach, okay, you're coming out. It's the final step out of Egypt. And He's telling you, He said, He said, the commandments to teach you to perform in the land would to which you are crossing. You can't perform in the land to which you're crossing the same way you performed in Egypt. You're no longer a slave to that. So that you will, he so that you will fear Yahweh, your Elohim, to observe all His decrees and commandments that I command you, you, your child, and your grandchild, all the days of your life, so that your days will be lengthened. You shall hearken, O Israel, and beware to perform so that it will be good for you and so that you'll increase very much. Now let's read 6 and 4 and 5. We can't read it together because we're all different. Oh, we're all different. We've got different books. Don't yeah, we, all we do. <laughs> we're all going to be speaking different languages. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Melissa, you read out of yours. So go ahead and keep reading it at four. Now, from four to, where is that, about eight? Yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Until we, nine. Maybe we can all read about each of our. Right. Yeah, okay. let's do that. That's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Let's start. Billy, you want to start back there? I always forget about Billy. He's back there with the PA and the camera. <laughs> and I always forget he's there. If you want to start on 6 and, and, and read 6-4, chapter 6, verse 4 through verse 9, through the end of verse 9. 
You read it out of the one you're reading. Okay. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Ehad. Hear, Israel, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is one. And you are to love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, all your being, and with all your resources. These words which I am ordering you today are to be on your heart. And you are to teach them carefully to your children. You are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you are traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them on your hand as a sign. Put them on the front of a headband around your forehead. And write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. Next. Who wants to read it next? Roger? Huh? Roger, Roger, you want to go next? I'll, I'll read it, but I don't like what it says. <laughs> okay. It's a uh, Jerusalem Bible, and it's got a little bit of twist. Yeah, it's got a little, I, I've got one of those at the house. <laughs> it says, listen, Israel, Yahweh our God is the one Yahweh. No, 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 there's only one Yahweh. There's no comparison. <laughs> you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Let these words I urge on you today be written on your heart. You shall repeat them to your children and say them over to them, whether at rest in your house or walking abroad, at your lying down or at your rising. You shall fasten them on your hand as a sign and on your forehead as a circlet. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Rest of us. Bruce? Yeah, Hear, O Israel. Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is the one and only. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your resources. And these matters that I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire, and when you arise. Bind them as a sign upon your arm, and let them be ornaments between your eyes, and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. It mine's the same way as Ruth, so I don't need to repeat it. Okay. Yeah. You, you might want to mention uh, for your visitor that's with the phylacteries. Yes. Thank you. Phylacteries. These that? things... Where he says that right there, okay, yeah. where he says you bind them upon your arm, put them as frontless between your eyes, that's what these are all about. That's where these come from. And then in addition to that, he writes it upon our hearts. Our hearts, I, I, I heard this explanation one day, and I, I thought this was pretty good. This came from out west, okay. Our hearts are branded with the word. Our hearts are branded. Would that be a seal? Seal. Or seal. Just like a signet ring. Or seal. It, it, it's also in scripture somewhere talks about it, it's up on, on our foreheads. Mm -hmm. Front looks between your eyes. Or he has a mark on us and on our forehead. He, he knows us. He, he knows say, us. He does say that in the last days he will mark his own. He will mark his own. You want to read from the one you got? Go ahead. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord. Now shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And these words which I command to thee this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the Lord, and when thou liest down. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand. Thou shalt be as frontman between thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house. Yeah, some of us have doorposts on our doorposts. We actually, we actually have one right on the doorpost. All right, we have one on the doorpost as you come in here. We have one on the back doorpost too. I have one on the doorpost in my home. Front door and the back door. If you go, if you go to some people's houses. They have them on every doorpost in the entire house, except for one. The bathroom. Bathroom. Restroom door. Bathroom. They go on the refrigerator door. 
I don't want another refrigerated door. I don't want anything stopping me on my way. Huh. <laughs> if I'm getting in that fridge, I want what's in there. <laughs> okay, so mine's the same as Danny's and Bruce's, so we won't go from there. Uh, we about, should be. What about, what about the Ted? Oh, Ted. Uh, well, this is the same. Jewish, so it's the same. It's the same Billy. as Billy. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Voices. Yeah. Uh, I keep calm in Huh? I heard in some of these other translations that same issue that I mentioned with this one. Okay. That of comparing him to another. Because, I mean, is a I think it's the closest thing you can come to being unique. There is one, there is only one, there is no method or basis of quantifying or measuring. I, I always challenge where it says and the, the one and only. Yeah. I think there's only one. He's one Lord. He hot is oneness. He's one. We can never lose the oneness of he has. No. This is a. But this is also why uh, the, the the term God with capital G is is kind of, is questioned because there are sure. many gods, small g. In this world, so why should we even uh, lump him in the same mass of, of, of unholiness mm -hmm. as with them? Because he is so far above. In fact, we can't even say holiness, because all all pagan religions have holy men, and he is so far far above all of them. Yes. So we, we cannot call him holy. We cannot call him God. He he is set apart. He is Elohim. He is Yahweh, and He is Ikhah. So, so uh, I, I would like to have a better understanding. Uh, he's talking about Yahweh is one. But what about Yeshua? What about the rope of the gas? The word Elohim is actually plural. <laughs> it means oneness in a plural sense. I got that right? Yeah. Any, any Hebrew scholars? Okay. It took me a long time for me to wrap my, my little finite little brain that's inside my skull here around that. It's, it's, not, it's talking about oneness in a plural sense. It is a plural word in Hebrew, ihad is. It is a plural word. So when we say that is, when we say ihad, we mean the oneness of what? The oneness of Yahweh. You know, it, it's like, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. I, I can't, I can't come up with a, an English explanation. What's that, Roger? You can't. I yeah. heard someone say to uh, curse God is a sin, it's blasphemy. To define him is a greater blasphemy. To so try we, to define so him. Don't. So, Ray, Ray, Brother Ray, I ask you, do not explain. Do not explain? I don't want you to be creating blasphemy. That, that's, that, that's, the, that, that's the uniqueness that he has. You know, and there's something else we have to understand here. No matter how we... No matter what, what version or edition we read it, okay? If it's not in the Hebrew, there are some words that do not translate well. Amen. There are some words that we just lose something in the translation. Like copper. Like, yeah, we, we have, let's give this example. I can't remember your name. Darius. Darius. Let's give this example for Darius. I think almost everybody was here. You were here, weren't you, Jim? When we went through that. And everyone about corn. Copper, brass, and it was about corn. We were talking about this side, and you say corn and corn. corn. Growing there, wasn't grow, growing back then. Right. And then that one version of somebody's Bible said corn. Said corn. And there was okay. no corn there. And they, there's no corn. Corn doesn't grow in the Middle East. Okay. If they grow corn in the Middle East right now, it's because they brought the seed over there and they grow it there. It's not a natural crop in the Middle East. Okay. It, it's like... It's, it's just it just doesn't happen there. It wasn't put there. Yahweh didn't put it there when he made, when he created the thing. But never mind your, your analogy. Copper what? Yeah. Well, when we were talking about the metals, I can't remember the exact word, 
But everybody had a different word. Copper, it, bronze, and there was a third one. Yeah, there's there copper, bronze. Brass. Yeah. Brass. 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 Yeah. Copper, bronze, and brass. These three metals were being talked about earlier in, in, in the Torah. So when we looked at that, we found that the, the same Hebrew word was translated those three ways because it had the ability to be all three things. It had the ability to be all three. In the Hebrew. In the Hebrew. In the Hebrew. So what we had did was we came across a word that could not be okay, translated in English. Couldn't properly be translated into English. It happens that way. I, I learned in, in my five years that I worked with my friend Saad Mikhail, the Egyptian, okay? I learned a lot about Hebrew and Arabic. He spoke both Hebrew and Arabic. Aramaic? Aramaic. And he was raised in Egypt, okay? That was their native tongue. That's what they spoke in Egypt, okay? And, and he said there are words in those two languages, because those two languages are very closely related. There are words in those two languages that there are no words for in English and French and German. There's no words for that. How about Latin and Greek? <laughs> I took three years of Latin, brother. <laughs> There's nothing in Latin. <laughs> That's a, I, I, I used to get upset when people told me I was studying a dead language, but let me inform you of something. I was studying a dead language. <laughs> okay, the only people that speak Latin are pharmacists. <laughs> okay. Pharmacists are good at Latin. Well, what about those ones in that other other congregation, uh, the Catholic group? They you speak what's called Latin. Church Latin. There's a difference between Church Latin and Roman Latin. Unless you go to what's the group of Catholics? What's Coptic. the group? Huh? Coptics or? No, those are Coptic Christians are more like Greek Orthodox. But there's a group of Latin. There's a group of Catholics oh, yeah, yeah, that want to yeah, yeah. put... Oh, yeah, the Latin-only people. Yeah, the Latin-only people. There's a church of them down in Dayton, huh? Yeah, yeah. Our next-door neighbor used to go down there. Yeah, and to each there, what they want. <laughs> okay? So, we've, we've read the Shema here in the Scripture. You come across the Shema some more, just in different spots here and there. But Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 is the basis of the Shema. Are we ready to go to verse 10? Let's go. And now are your own brain instruction, the laws and rules with which I charge you today. And that's it. That that's it. That is the end of the portion. If you uh, take note on any of the notes that come along the way, there are uh, lows there. I didn't read any. I didn't read the notes this week. I did. I found out about the Torah scrolls, and I was so excited. All I did was study about Torah scrolls. May I yes, share I a verse about yes. this relationship between Joshua and Moses? Yes. At the end of Moses' life, it is found in Exodus 33 and verse 11. As we just read, this is the scenario that we repeat time and again at the Passover. Um, of course, Passover means going over into the promised land. In Exodus 33, 11, we're told how Moses would go out to the tent of the presence. People would stand in their tent door mm -hmm. and watch the cloud and everything. Mm -hmm. In our Passover services, there is a portion that's recalled or referred to as the opticoma. Yes. Where we take a piece of bread, bread of life, take bread, not the and wrap it in a cloth and put it away for later. It's sometimes called dessert. No, it's not dessert. <laughs> it's our lifeblood. It's our life. You'll notice in verse 11 of 33 Exodus, Moses would go out and come back, but Joshua stayed in the tent like that piece of optic coleman for he was to come after Moses. And that's why, and that's why at our Seder meal, we take that piece of, of Afri Komen, Yes. and we hide it. We wrap it and we hide it, and we let the children go find it, because they are to come after us. They're the ones to carry it forward from us. Should he tear it? Should he tear it? 
and Yeshua was the one to come after it all and bring it all to fullness and wholeness. See, most don't really understand that when you start, when you really study Torah, what do you really study? <laughs> History. The history. The truth. You're, st you're studying the history. You're, you're studying the truth of what came when, before. Roger, was he the bread? He was the bread, just like you were saying, a, a little piece of bread wrapped up. So, uh, he was the bread. Well, think about it. I've got an example. Hey, I'm not without an example, Roger. Good. <laughs> We learned that. Mm -hmm. What do I have here? Matzo. 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 A piece of matzo. A piece of matzo. What's unique about a piece of matzo? Now I want you to think. Yes. I want you to think about your shoe. Just think about your shoe, okay? Don't concentrate on you. You think about your shoe. Now we're looking at a piece of matzo, okay? Danny and I like matzo. We're looking at this piece of matzo, and we see some things about this piece of matzo. It doesn't have to be square. You can have round matzo. It doesn't make any difference. Although the ones that really think about round matzo will tell you round matzos, it'll make a difference, but it doesn't make a difference. So you got this piece of matzo. What's the first thing you notice on this piece of matzo? It's brown. Hmm? It's uh, brown. It's, it's, it's got little brown spots on it. Right? What's the second thing you notice about the piece of matzo? It's got white spots. Well, it's got, it's got cream colored in it. It's got, it's got dry. holes. It looks dry. It's got what? Holes. It's got little tiny holes in it. Piercings. It's got piercings. Square. Huh? Yeah. What could be? What, if I do one now, what is it now? It could be round. It could be. Yeah. Make any difference? You break, you'll break it off eventually. Yeah. Eventually, you'll break that piece. Okay. Eventually, you'll break it. But, but when it's sitting here on that Passover table in front of you, on that Seder table, there's no there, there, there's no yeast in this. Okay. Now you're thinking about your shoe, right? Okay. So. When Yeshua died, when Yeshua died, what's one thing that they did to him? Huh? Well, before he died. I should say before he died. I said that wrong. Okay. Before he died. Yeah, before he died. What happened to him just before he died? The last two or three days? The last supper. Huh? The last supper. After the last supper. The last supper. They whipped him. Yeah, he was whipped. He was beaten. He was beaten. He was bruised. What's all the little brown spots look like? Bruising. Bruised. Bruises. He was bruised. He was bruised. When they took him and they nailed him, they nailed his hands, they nailed his feet. And then remember, one of the, one of the centurions took a spear, did he not, and pierced yeah. his side. Okay? All the little holes are piercings. When they nailed him, they pierced his hands, they pierced his feet, they pierced his side. There's no leaven in this. At the same time of Pesach, of Passover, there's another feast we celebrate out of Leviticus 23. There's another feast. What's that feast? Feast of unleavened bread. You see, in order for Yeshua to be the Mashiach, there are certain things that had to happen. They had to happen. He had to fulfill prophecy. He had to fulfill the prophecy. Oh, I also need to know leaven is sin. Yeah. Le leaven represents sin. Every time you hear leaven, I, I don't care where you're reading, every time you hear leaven in your Bible, in your Torah, in your Tanakh, okay, in your renewed covenant, it represents one thing and one thing only. What does it represent? Sin. Come on, Jim. Jump in here. Iniquity. Iniquity. Sin. And it, 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 it represents our sin. There's no leaven in a piece of matzah. It's unleavened bread. The feast of unleavened bread, if you look in Leviticus 23, you'll plainly see the feast of unleavened bread falls right at the same times as Pesach, as Passover falls. 
you, you go Passover, and you go Feast of Unleavened Bread's in there, and what's another feast that's in there? Feast of the First Fruits. Feast of the First Fruits. What did Shaul, what, what, what did Shaul, Paul, what, what, what did he call that? He mentioned it in Corinthians. He said, he, he said he was the first fruits of the dead. Amen. He rose. I know in Christianity it's all about Easter Sunday. Okay? Big day. You know, I, I grew up in that. Mom had a new hat. Dad had a new suit. I had new shoes. It was Easter Sunday. Okay? Didn't he, uh, a little girl that had died, didn't he bring her out of sleep? Her dad? Remember? One of yeah. The miracles? Mm -hmm. So how could he be the first when she was the first? But he became the first fruits of the dead. He was dead and buried. She wasn't buried. She wasn't buried. What about the, what, the what about what, what, what about Lazarus? Yeah. Okay. Lazarus was put back into the tomb and he brought him out. What was that a symbol of? What was it? What was Lazarus a symbol of? The resurrection to come. Remember, he he, he could have went right away when he got the word about Lazarus. He could have he could have ran there. Right. He wanted him to be. Dead. But he didn't care about that. Yeah, he wanted him to be. What's that? A friend of mine said years ago. He wanted him to be good and dead. Yeah, he wanted him to be okay. stinky dead. Yeah, he wanted him to be stinky dead. Stinky dead. So, so he took his time. Didn't he stop along the way? I think he stopped along the way once, didn't he? So, 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 so here we have him as, as the first fruits. Now, when I, I spoke about Easter Sunday a minute ago, Easter Sunday always falls on what day? Sunday. Feast of first fruits. Feast of first fruits. It's on the feast of first fruits falls on the first day of the week. Sunday's what? The first day of the week. So. Easter Sunday is not found in the Scripture, but first fruits is. That's why Shaul said he was the first fruits of the dead. He kept every one of those feasts. He was the, he was the Passover lamb without spot or blemish. They found no leaven in him. He was the matzah. He was the feast of unleavened bread. He well, rose on well, the first... Well, they also said the uh, Passover lamb was also... Uh, when they were in Egypt there, they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and the, uh, the, the one that went to kill all the firstborn, mm -hmm. if they didn't have the lamb's blood on the doorpost, they, were, they, they died. Right. If they saw the blood, they passed over that house. The angel passed over that house. The death angel. Yeah. So, that's matzah. That's unleavened. That's what Yeshua was. The Afrikoman, when we say Afrikoman, you take, you have these pieces of matzah, and you take one of them and you slide it into a pocket, or you wrap it in a, I usually wrap it, you, you wrap it in a, in a handkerchief, and you take that, and you put it somewhere. We always hide it somewhere, and then we let the children go look for it. Okay? The next generation, we have to spur the next generation to do the same thing we did until he comes. 